Hello and welcome into another edition of Head Coach U. I am Brian Fisher, joined as always by former BYU and Virginia coach Bronco Mindenhall and another special guest that we have on this week, Tim Murphy, the head coach at Harvard for the past 29 years, the winningest coach in Ivy League history. Tim, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, happy to be here, Brian. Well, we're, we're thrilled to get you on because I, I think we, we know that every coach has a unique perspective on the program, but, but you certainly do. Uh, you know, they're, they're in the Ivy League. And uh, I, I'm sad to say that as, as a former quarterback, we got another line, ex-linebacker on, on the show. We, we got two of them here. Uh, but but the funny thing, you know, researching your, your kind of beginnings as a coach, you almost went to business school. And, and so I'm kind of curious if we can kind of go back to those days. Well, what made you change uh, and, and, and kind of pivot away from, from coaching and think about going to vis- business school? And then why did you kind of stick around with the uh, profession and uh, have so much success nowadays? Well, uh, trying to make a long story short, I was the first and only one, Brian, in my family to ever go to college. Um, And I can remember very vividly when I was a junior in high school, my high school uh, football coach, John Montosi, my high school basketball coach, Dick Arrieta, cornered me in the hallway. These days, Brian, I think they would call it an intervention, but they just cornered me in the hallway and they said, Hey, uh, what do you what do you do when you graduate? We've heard some rumors, and I said, I don't know. I'll probably join the Marines. And they looked at each other and said, No, that's not happening. And I said, The hell it isn't. I'm joining the Marines. And they basically said, Shut up, son. You're going to college, and walked away. And the rest is history. Um, I had really great coaches and role models in high school. They really cared. It's not something you can fake. And you know, they got me a, a half scholarship to play Division II football. Um, that eventually turned into a full scholarship. Uh, um, to their point, uh, I, I apparently was a lot smarter than I gave myself credit for. Uh, I ended up getting two degrees while in college. It was the first year that you could also get a grad degree uh, that just timed up. Um, and I was one of the few in the country that year. Um, I knew then I wanted to go into coaching. My college coach, Howie Vandersee, who I'm still very close with, talked to him at least once a month. Um, helped me get a job at Brown University. Um, you know, this was back in the day a bit, but it wasn't back in the Stone Ages. Um, I think I, I made I made fifteen hundred dollars for the year, and then in the off season, uh, I would work the graveyard shift in an extrusion mill. Now I had a, I had a master's degree, so the person the person who was hiring me said, "Wait a minute, you're, you're not going to be here. You what are you, what are you doing here?" And I said, "Hey, I need this job." I worked 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. in in a mill, got four hours sleep, and then would go to the office. Um, I then got promoted to a higher level my second year. My third year, I got my first full-time job at the FCS level uh, at at Lafayette College. Uh, We had a very fortunate turnaround, and I got the offensive line job at Boston University, who at that time was a FCS uh, power, was there three years was fortunate from there to move as a coordinator. And then my second year as a coordinator at the University of Maine, um, I had I had applied to graduate business school and it came. I had interviewed at only two schools, uh, Colgate Darden School at the University of Virginia and the Kellogg School at uh, Northwestern. And I was just I was extremely surprised that I got in. Um, So I'd actually tendered my resignation as the offensive coordinator at the University of Maine. And it's funny how things work. That coach left. I was 30 years old and they offered me the head coaching job. And I was quite honestly conflicted because I'd worked so hard to get into a, you know, a top five graduate business school. Um, and had already committed to go to uh, the Kellogg School at Northwestern. Um, but they, you know, I, I felt I felt bad that, you know, this people really wanted me to be their coach and I was kind of leaving town. So I said, all right, I'll give it a year and get this out of my system. And that was 36 years ago. <laughs> it doesn't sound like you got it out of your system yet. <laughs> no, no, not quite. Although my wife, my wife is wishing I will. I, I, that resonates. So I, I would love, I would love to know. And, in, and in, in just what I see in today's college football. And I remember, and in, in you remembered more specifically, we were at a coaching convention for Nike in, in Pennsylvania. You said, I didn't remember where riding back to the airport. But you left an impression on me as to, I think, uh, this idea of what I just call and, which means that there's a, a, a man, a coach leading a program, and it's super successful on the field, but at a place that really, really values 
and supports um, the education of young people in a true and authentic way in a league that not only espouses values, but backs them up in terms of uh, doing more than just playing the game. And so all that was coming through my head. And, and uh, so I'm, I would love to hear um, coach just your, like, who are these kids that get to Harvard and what, what, what are the requirements for someone to even show up and how do they get in and what does their day look like? And, and running a program like you are with this unique type of amazing young person, I, I would just love to know more about who they are and, and, and what qualifications and what their day looks like. Well, it was a circuitous route to get here. Um, at age 32, um, I got the head coaching job at the University of Cincinnati. Um, I, I'm sure primarily because, you know, at that point it was a broken program. No one wanted the job. Um, they were ranked 122 out of 123 teams. Uh, their coach had just been fired. Uh, they lost another 18 scholarships for NCAA reasons. Um, then their stadium was condemned, literally. Um, so that's why I got the job at age 32 and um, was there five years. We went from one in 10, uh, you know, ranked 122 to 25th in the nation. Our, our last, our fifth year there where we, we went for a, believe it or not, school record eight and three. And, you know, Bronco, how people sort of have expectations these days about if you're fortunate enough to be a young coach who's part of a turnaround like that, you know, what your trajectory is going to be, where you're going to go next. And people were shocked when I took a 50% pay cut to come to Harvard. Yeah. And um, people said, how can you do that? I said, well, first of all, um, I didn't Love get that. into the profession to make money. Um, not that I wouldn't love to make what, uh, you know, the guys in the SEC or quite frankly, any of the power five conferences, it's, it's certainly out of control. And we can talk about that later. Um, but I, I, I wanted to coach at a place where I, I wanted to see what it was like for players who played for the love of the game and yet are still playing division one football. Mm -hmm. I also, part of it was the, you know, the person who, you know, barely went to college. And upon my interview, I was just so impressed with the uh, character of the people I met, uh, Billy Cleary, the AD, um, uh, our uh, Jack Ridden, our head of alumni, um, our uh, director of uh, admissions, Bill Fitzsimmons. They were just such obvious, palpable, uh, really impressive character, high character people. And I just really connected with them. When I interviewed, I didn't think I'd take the job, but the interview was so great. I, I made that life decision. And I also, quite frankly, had this back of my mind, you know, maybe maybe if we do a really good job at, at Harvard, the way we did at Cincinnati, the way we did at Maine, I don't know, maybe, maybe one of our kids, you got to dream big, maybe one of our kids can go to Harvard. And my mom were alive today, Bronco. She could not fathom that all three of her kids are Ivy uh -huh. League graduates. So, yeah, it's a great country. So, uh, um, so the kids that, uh, and these young men that play for you, they're non-scholarship. Is that, is that correct? That's right. And basically scholarships are based on need. If you have a very strong need, we have probably 40% of our team are, are on full scholarship, uh, but they are no different than the regular students that come to the college. It's also ironic that we happen to be the largest jock school on planet earth. Bear with me. Uh, we have 42 Division one varsity sports, which means on our campus from kids all across the country and all across the world, we have more recruited division one athletes on our campus than any place on planet earth. And what our folks figured out a long time ago, if you take these really bright, super high character kids, it's amazing what they accomplish when they're here and even more amazing when they leave the college. So that's sort of the down low, um, yeah. you know, something you're not going to read in USA Today of why Harvard happens to invest in so many student athletes. The so character you, is critical. Yeah. So when you're considering the, the selection and assessment process, the, the outside world calls it recruiting. I, I don't like that word as much. I, I like selection and assessment and, and discovery. And so I love the word that you were just mentioning about high character. And so like when you're, when you're considering who you might want um, on your team or that would really fit at Harvard regarding the character component, like what 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 clues or what cues are you looking for or what have you found to be helpful in in determining that 
knowing right the academic rigor is one thing playing a college sport in addition to that is going to be another challenge so how can you tell or can you tell like who's really going to thrive as you're going through that process you know i i I sort of only half kid people and I'm not good at much, but I've really always had a good feel for people. Uh, And that includes the almost 1000 student athletes we've recruited during our tenure. Um, You just have that gut feeling about people. Um, The gut feeling of, you know, the best friend you chose when you were 12 years old, who happens to be the Dartmouth coach, Buddy Tevens, who I'm playing this (laughs) week, which is a large uh, to the person you marry, to the to the select friends that you have, but also to the kids you recruit. Uh, I remember recruiting Ryan Fitzpatrick, who played 18 years in the NFL. And I just he just had that it factor. And he didn't even say a lot during my visit to his home in Arizona. But I just knew this kid was somehow special. That's what I've been fortunate to be pretty good at. Just and Harvard really rewards character because they know it transcends whatever your SAT is. It transcends whatever you think your limitations are. And when those kids leave here, they go out and crush it in the real world. And, and they leave a, an extremely favorable impression uh, by everybody in their wake. When you're, when you're leading your program, and just as you mentioned, they're crushing it in the real world when they leave, which I love that idea, which I think is the reason college athletics exists is to help young people crush it in the real world when they leave. So I, I love that idea. Um, knowing how competitive I'm sure they are in the game of football, do you find yourself having to remind them that they're intending to have to, you'd like them to crush it in the real world? Or is that just kind of built in where they're, you know, that's part of their motivation the whole time, even though they're playing football for you, which is so time intensive and focused, do you feel like you have to add that in? Or is that kind of just part of who they are uh, as you're working with them? I think it's both, Bronco. Like anything else, as a parent, as a coach, you want to constantly remind your kids, um, you know, within the, you know, not as a daily thing, but just to remind them of why you're here and what the expectations are and why we thought you were special and tangibly. And that's why we recruited you and how that has to transcend everything you do. And um, it, it isn't that we don't make mistakes at time we do. Um, but to have a graduation r- rate of at Harvard for football and all athletes and students of about 99 percent, you know, we and the really extraordinary thorough look that admissions gets in admissions, you know, we do a good job of uh, of choosing the people that uh, that come here. Uh, having said that, you know, you still lose some great kids who, um, you know, maybe want to play at Northwestern instead or Notre Dame or Duke or any of the great, you know, Stanford academic athletic schools. We certainly lose some good kids to that because they don't have to pay anything. Yeah. So when, when uh, you mentioned uh, recruiting a young, a young man from, I think, Arizona. So where, where, where are these kids coming from? So when you look at your roster yearly, um, is it mostly from the Northeast or are they coming from just all over the planet? Absolutely all over the planet. Um, we have kids currently on our roster from about 30 different states. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, if you, I'm, I'm just trying to think of our, our, our secondary. Uh, we got one, our, one's from Arkansas, our, one safety from Arkansas, the other one's from Texas, one corner's from Illinois, the other corner's from Florida. And so it goes, Bronco. Yeah, it could wow. be from anywhere. And so uh, going back to more specifically for the Ivy League and, and not just for Harvard, the academic requirements, can you give like those listening, what, what, who, who are these kids academically um, that are playing in this league and playing at Harvard? Yeah, um, the challenge for us at Harvard is we have the highest uh, academic requirements of any school in the nation. We also have a tier system uh, for the Ivy League to recruit, meaning Um, Harvard has the highest academic index, and that's a combination of GPA, SAT, ACT, and it's quantified. And we have the highest, and so we can't not necessarily um, shop in the same store that other schools in our, uh, and and it makes it, it makes the league, you know, very even because, you know, some people may feel, well, how do you compete against Harvard? Well, you, you don't necessarily have to and still get good players. So it's, it's um it's a tiered system that makes it 
challenging, but apparently relatively fair. What, what, what changes have you seen within, I would just say the landscape of college football, we were talking earlier before the show and how you have graduate transfers now playing at the four or five or six different schools you mentioned. And, and now they've graduated from Harvard, which is amazing and they'll crush it in the world. And then uh, as a graduate, they're going to play somewhere else. Uh, what other changes or just things that you, maybe you've noticed with the landscape through all your time? Yeah, it seems like Bronco for me about every 10 years, things change. And I think you would agree the kids we're recruiting now are awesome kids but they're very different from the kids of 30 years ago or 35 years ago. Um, this group of young people, um, they're all, um, they all embrace technology so effortless, effortlessly and it's part of their life. Um, whether that is social media, whether that is, you know, anything technological and it's different. You know, if you look at, let's call the greatest generation of, football players coming out of World War II, Bronco, what they were like and how tough and how, you know, unbelievably um, driven they were. Um, these kids are different. They're great. They're awesome. They're my kids, Molly Connor and Grace Murphy, um, but they're different. And it's, um, and you have to, if you don't adapt, if you don't evolve to that, um, you're not going to be successful. And they're just different as the next generation will be. But if you look at the whole of Division One football, I think it's fair to say that um, we're now at the very highest level power five conferences. It is absolutely positively professional football. Oh, by the way, without any rules. Yeah, it, it is so far off the off the freeway that uh, I, I just can't imagine it, it's. I wish I could say I saw this coming five years ago. I, I did not to this level. Yeah. When you think about um, the, the future of college football and where it might go or, or how it might be realigned to how, how you see it to where it could really add value, uh, what, what are the core issues that, that you see from with your perspective and success and just the lenses that you've earned over all this time? What, what do you think are the core issues that uh, are contributing or how we might correct it? Well, I think the core issues at the very highest level with the Power Five conferences and, and leagues like the SEC and uh, the Big Ten as examples, um, if you don't get a handle on it to somehow stabilize it to more of an NFL model, it, it's not coming back to the model we have, but at least in the NFL model, you can at least create some equity within the system if we know that, okay, the NIL has to be the same for every university as opposed to that. The NCAA, as you know, you know, they threw up the white flag, you know, a, a while back, realizing that I think it's fair to say the SEC, they needed the SEC more than the SEC needed them. And the reality is that they've got to get that in hand at the highest level. And I think that will work out because if you don't, there's only eight schools in the country that are playing for a national championship. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that, Bronco? I, I would. And one of the things that, that, I've, that I've noticed is, um, number one, acknowledging that, right, those eight. But here's the, here to me is the, the heartbreaking part of it. Another 50 think they can. And so they operate their programs like they can with the priority system of a national championship is first, the monetization of that and the commercialization of it immediately following with quite frankly, the educational part and the development part of the players, some part after that. And so really by chasing that model with, with resources that don't match that, and quite frankly, not a likelihood and, and anyone can argue there's always the upset. The problem is when you, when you build an entire system on the smallest percentage of occurrence that can happen, <laughs> Uh, it really does not serve um, those that are uh, pretending that they can. And unfortunately, I think there are 40 to 50 ish of those schools chasing that at the expense of a, a college athletic experience, not lack of performance. I'm not saying that I'm saying in addition to performance, they could be magically developing these kids to truly, I like, I like the word crush it after college, right? Which is, that's lasting, it's substantive, and it makes a real difference. 
And somehow, besides those eight, there's so many others that think they're those eight, and they're not. And just an infusion of truth and transparency, and at what expense, I think would really help. And so, uh, to your question, I agree. Well, to your point, Bronco, um, we all knew w when, once upon a time, the 20-hour rule was real. Well, now, think of what it really is. Um, and the reality is that with the professionalization of Division One football, um, you know, if you're a really serious student, where do you find the time? Yeah. Where do you find the time? Now, we don't have those issues here whatsoever. And I think that's one of the really beautiful, not perfect, but beautiful things about the Ivy League and Harvard University is our kids are really serious athletes in all 42 sports. Yeah. We've had in the last five years – kids in the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, NHL hockey. And we had a girl um, that was not super highly recruited who ran the second fastest 200 meters in the Olympics in, in world history. Gabby <laughs> Thomas, who's going to go to med school. Yeah. You know, but um, so, it, yeah, it, it's different for sure. And we're far from perfect, but this is, I think my gut instinct way back when um, to come to Harvard was you know for that reason that's how i saw it i did not necessarily see major college football going off the rails as much as it has um but i knew this would be a very comfortable environment for me you know when you mentioned and what what captivates me is you just mentioned those uh athletes that have gone on to accomplish amazing things um in the professional world of athletics what i love about that is they're surrounded by, and, and then you mentioned um, Debbie Thomas, who's going to medical school while running the second fastest 200s on planet Earth, right? So when, when I'm talking about and, that's what I'm, I'm thinking about. So the kids that play in your program and then who they become in addition to that, while they're winning, while they're competing for championships, while they're playing at a high level, that's while they're becoming this longtime contributor in this other capacity to really make a difference. And I think the Ivy League has it right. I, I really do. And I know I'm idealistic in today's world, uh, but I value um, the human spirit and each individual's capability. And and one of the reasons I wanted to, to just visit with you on the show is, is to provide our listeners just another way to think about college football and what it might look like. And this will be followed up by one of the coaches from the academies. And just let's just talk about what this could really look like, um, because it doesn't seem well, it's quite frankly, um, Harvard and the Ivy League is an outlier right now. Right. And and the academies are an outlier. And and I like this idea of just bringing some light to what else is possible. And could that happen if we infused some of that into the power five structure? Well, eventually, as you mentioned, there's going to be a certain amount of power five schools that realize that the path to where they want to get there, if they do not somehow, you know, have rules that applies to everybody and have, you know, some type of salary cap and operate it more like the NFL, um, then you're going to have kids just constantly who are professional athletes. Everybody's in the portal. Everybody's looking for a, a better payday. And, and the portal itself is just out of control. And to get back to some sense of sanity, they have to get this thing somehow under an umbrella that works. Um, but the NCAA is not going to do that because the SEC doesn't need the, the NCAA. Um, so, again, I know what a good model is. I just don't know who can put that all together and agree, and agree to it. Because if you're, you know, you know who we're talking about, if you're Alabama, you're Georgia, um, you're Texas, you're, you know, Ohio State, et cetera. Um, you don't need the NCAA and you don't necessarily need or want it to be homogenized in any way that has a little bit more equity for everybody. I see that in that group of schools um, and however many there are, right, that will choose to, 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 to join that model, which, by the way, I would endorse that there is there is a tier of that. Then there would be about 50 ish, maybe academic power fives. So, somehow, I don't know what we call it, but that that's really the group I'm talking about now. And there's a way to add real value um, with 
in that component in that space. How to do it, uh, I'm not sure. Um, but I, I think the portal, I would love to say, and a lot of times coaches, as, as coaches, we complain about the portal. And this, this idea um, really originated a lot with us. So, so there's, um, I came from, at one time, the Mountain West Conference at Brigham Young University, which then became independent. And then I was a Power Five coach. Um, and so there's an upward mobility and a, and the speed in which coaches now, quite frankly, enter the portal, right? And and uh, I love the idea of seeing someone sustainable at a place as long as you have, almost becoming intertwined within the identity of an institution, right? There's a magic in that to me. When the right leader with the right values um, aligns with an institution and is able to have success in all capacities, I love that idea. We're probably the exact opposite now in the world of college football, where whatever level um, coaches also, right? And I've done this, so I'm not judging. I'm just stating um, we'll leave for um, the next job that's higher, right? And more money. And so players, quite frankly, are doing what many of us have done. And so, again, I'm not judging. I'm just contributing factors, examples, and modeling is a powerful tool. And I think uh, along the way, some of us as leaders have uh, have uh, um, helped influence that where where the ideal would be when I was growing up in the NFL. I remember Don Shula was the coach of the Dolphins. I remember Chuck Knoll was the coach of the Steelers. I remember Bud Grant was the coach of the Vikings. Right. It seemed like an institution or even a professional sports team was tied to an iconic head coach and leader that was there. Um, I'm not sure how many head coaches I can name now at the NFL level. And I think that's going to be similar in college football pretty soon, uh, as you see the, the changes that happen so frequently. Uh, there's no question about it. And, you know, I, I look at just one Big Ten recent move. You know, I, I thought their head coach had done a remarkable job for the time he was there. And then all of a sudden he was just expendable. And, you know, they'd pay his $10 million, you know, and it's, you know, I, it's, Boy, it's it's just very very interesting how much money is involved, and how people can just all of a sudden say, "I've got a good coach in six months." You say, "No, nah, we're cutting them loose." It's um, it, it's 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 it makes it hard, other than the um, monetary aspect, uh, you know, to really say this is uh, um, probably as good a profession maybe as it was 15, 20 years ago. I love what I do. I'm so fortunate to be a coach. I won't do this forever, <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, it's definitely different. Um, my, you know, when my son, you know, I, I think at one point talked about possibly going to coach and I just said, well, you're going to have great opportunities. Um, I'm not sure your mother would let you. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're um, when you're visiting with these kids that are, are considering Harvard, um, as you present your program as to uh, what value will be added to their lives, uh, I would love just to hear, like when you're talking to them in today's world, uh, how do you present that and, and, and what does that sound or look like? Well, you know, we obviously talk to a very diverse group like any, um, like any college football coach. Um, and for a lot of our kids, believe it or not, uh, we still have X amount of kids every, every year that they're the first people in their family to ever go to college. Wow. And I just talk about how Harvard can be life-changing. Now that sounds very self-serving, but it is in this context. And they'll, and they'll say, well, what do you mean? I go, well, what happens when, when people ask you who's offered you when you say Harvard, how do they react? And they're like, they react like that's impossible. How, how is that possible? <laughs> yeah. And this is the one thing and not to get off on a tangent, but, I say to so many families that I recruit, this is a great country. We're far from perfect Bronco. And how do you know that? Well, because 50.1% believe in one thing and 49.9% believe in another. And that's great. That's what a democracy is about. But we're the only country on the planet where if you come here, whether that's somebody from Haiti or somebody from Ukraine or wherever, and you work hard enough and you work smart enough, you can create a new life for your family. Mm. And very few countries can, can you make that impact maybe in one generation. And I think that's the greatest thing about America. Um, education is where the power is. And 
you know, the better educated you become, the more options you have in life and the more options your children are going to have in life. And um, that was my motivation to originally go to business school. Uh, but I wanted to be a coach so bad. Um, but it's also why I end up choosing Harvard. For me, it was just the best fit. Yeah, I, I love I love that idea. And just the simple phrase of um, education is power. Uh, I would love that to be uh, the slogan for or the branding for college football. <laughs> and unfortunately, you if we said that and then each institution measured themselves against that, I'm talking football specifically, uh, there wouldn't be many where that fit. And, and so I love just hearing something that's aligned and authentic and real um, that has lasting value and education is power. Who better than the head coach at Harvard, right? <laughs> to be saying that. And after, after all these years of success and seeing so many different types of kids, uh, but also I think with a similar intent, it appears just the alignment and the fit, you recognize that from the very beginning. And maybe Bronco, I don't know. Um, maybe the planets, moves, moons, and stars um, come to a line that the people at Stanford or Duke or Northwestern uh, or Georgia Tech, and on and on and on. Maybe they realize maybe we all belong in the same conference. Yeah, yeah. It was it was one of the what we're talking about now was one of the reasons I chose Virginia. I love learning. I love becoming through knowledge and. And I was captivated and am captivated by by that idea, right? That you can not compromise the ability in which you play. That remains consistent or even enhanced by the other experiences that you're getting along the way um, to become. And and so back to your point, that the realignment possibility to me makes so much sense because each school can choose what matters most. And there can be the professional version of college football there can be a fierce academic version of college football in addition to the Ivy League, right, that plays great football. And then there can be uh, an amateur model that's somewhere in between. I, I don't know even what to call them, but it appears that it's just moving more toward like playing like rather than this model that we currently have. No question about it. Um, there'll be a regression to the mean, as they say, oh, and eventually totally. those 50 schools that you spoke to uh, are, are just going to realize there isn't a legitimate path to a national championship. There isn't a legitimate path to getting, you know, competing in recruiting. Yeah. And, and that in and of itself, it'll be really interesting uh, to, to hear and see just how it works. And I, I love the idea. Uh, um, again, when I thought about uh, who is getting it right. Right. Uh, so that's why you're on the, the time consistency and success. Right? And I'm not only talking on field, but of developing young people at a place that is designed to do the same thing um, and then possibly followed up by what um, so by the academies with these with these coaches that are developing amazing young people who, by the way, already have a commitment to be launched into the world in something they believe in. Right. And so my issue with the NIL is it's 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 focused so quickly It was supposed to be to help the players in our programs right become and uh, and uh, possibly get value added it moved immediately which we already knew would happen to the recruitment right and the illegal recruitment we knew that would, that was going to happen what hasn't been mentioned is what then is allowing the back end launching into the world to crush it in your words and the academies they have a really nice succession plan of wait here here's your football career and that's you're launching into the world in this compelling way at the institution that you are aligned with the values and now you're going to apply yourself within those values. And so they're doing a really nice job of, of the back end, much like a Harvard degree would do the academies. Now there's a trajectory. These kids are already starting on um, when they're done, which I love that idea of, of being prepared for life after football is over. Yeah, I, I, I love the academies. I have uh, such an appreciation for our men and women in uniform. And uh, not to get off on a tangent, Bronco, but I did a USO tour um, oh, cool. 12, years, 12 years ago. And I'll just give you the story because it is, if nothing else, uh, a little bit um, um, funny. Um, I got a call out of the blue from the USO. Um, and they said, Coach Murphy, you had signed up that you'd love to go on a USO tour. I said, yeah, I'm in. 
And they go, well, you don't understand. I go, no, you don't. I'm in. She goes, well, unfortunately, we had someone who you would have to replace. I said, fine. I go, well, we're leaving this Kansas air base tomorrow at 2 p.m. I says, I will get there. <laughs> we went. Uh, Chip Kelly was one of the other guys with me. We yeah. did. We, uh, Chip Kelly and the head coach at the time at West Point. It was us three. Hmm. In seven days, we did. Let's see, six countries, three continents, two warships, including landing and taking off on the USS Eisenhower in the Persian Gulf, <laughs> ending in Iraq on the last day and taking caskets home to Washington, D.C. on Memorial Day. Priceless. One of the greatest experiences I've ever had. But to that end, I have so much respect for the academies because they do have such a wonderful and important secession plan for these really high character kids. Yeah. And we, we recruit against all those schools mm -hmm. and we get some great kids and we get some great kids who choose to go that route as well to, uh, to go to the military after Harvard. But to your point, at some point, hopefully the planets and moons will align that for those type of super high character kids who may not be, you know, the number one kid at, a, at you know, the top SEC schools or um, Ohio State, you know, maybe they, we can find a good fit um, for everybody, um, realizing that professionalization of Division I football is here and it's not going away. When you uh, just one last, I just had another thought. When you're when you're um, working with your, I don't know how to say colleagues. So the other coaches in the Ivy League, is there is there a sense, almost a camaraderie or autonomy? I know there's fierce competition, like there there is in any league. I'm wondering if there's a, a an extra sense of camaraderie or identity because of similar purpose, um, not being in the league. What what's that like? Well, I think it's like how you projected it. There's there's a fair sense of competition, uh, but by the same token, um, you know, we know we're not curing cancer. You know, we know we're not, um, you know, signing uh, $10 million contracts. Um, so I think there is a lot more camaraderie than there may be if it's, you know, at the very highest level and, you don't know how much they're giving their NAL guys. And, you know, it, it's just a different world. Well, from for my standpoint, um, I, I was intentional and I am intentional about who I, I like to visit with on this show. And you've made an impact on me, even though we didn't know each other well. I've just kind of watched from afar and I appreciate the example, the influence and just all the work you've done at Harvard and, and just really grateful that you took some time out of your day to visit with us. And um, I'm appreciative. Uh, and and just express my gratitude to not only what you're doing at Harvard, but how you're doing it. And and that to me is where all the magic is. Well, thank you, Bronco. For what it's worth, you know, our hour we spent in the car philosophizing, uh, going to the airport. Uh, you made a a, a very impressive. Uh, uh, it was very impressed to meet you and and feel like that we are like minded. But uh, the reality is, I consider myself uh, so fortunate to be a college football coach to have had the very different but wonderful experiences I had. You know, when I was at the University of Maine, we had great kids. We had great yeah. kids at the University of Cincinnati. Everybody's everybody's different, um, but I feel very grateful that I've been in the profession this long and realize that I probably won't be able to do this forever. Well, we, we certainly hope that uh, you're going to continue and in, in, uh, lead in the Crimson for, for many, many years to come, Tim. But yeah, I, I was just curious to kind of follow up on, on this this fantastic conversation is, um, you know, as, as you are recruiting, as you are ha having some of these high achieving individuals on your football team over the years, do you, do you almost have to kind of manage that? We, we just had Blake Anderson on, on the podcast talking about mental health. I mean, you're talking about guys that are they're going on to, to found billion dollar companies and, and become doctors. Do you, do you almost have to kind of manage that thing uh, when, when they're on campus as well? Uh, just given that they, they are some of the highest achievers that you can find. Well, the mental health is real and we all, and we all realize that, um, you know, and we talked earlier in the conversation about, you know, if you look at the guys coming out of World War II, um, the greatest generation, if you will. Well, they really were the greatest generation. And if you look at that model of, let's just say, young men and women 
um, very different from the model today. Mental health is real. Now, if you're coming out of World War II, you're not admitting to anything. You're just going to grind it out and you're going to find a way to be successful. And there may be mental health issues, but it's not going to be part of the lexicon for decades. Um, these days, um, for the right reasons, um, you know, these are things that, you know, we try to educate our student athletes on. We have a mental health people here like any school does. And just remind kids that, hey, we're all in this together. If you need help, let us know. Um, we're not clairvoyant. And, and to also realize that if you're the, you know, if you're Bryce Young, you know, there's a lot of stress on you. If you're Ryan Fitzpatrick and, and the, you know, the quarterback at Harvard, there's a lot of stress on you. And it's, it's all relative. And, and we certainly um, take that very, very seriously and do the best we can to make sure that our kids are having that balance of a really great experience, but not being so overwhelmed that uh, other important things are either neglected or it loses the fun of it. One of the things too, Brian, that I'll just interject, um, the mental health isn't for just the young people as well. Um, coaches and, and Tim and I were talking, uh, pressure is real regardless. And when I chose to, to step away, immediately the number of head coaches that were calling just saying, man, did you get that right? And and they mostly were leading to their internal battles of managing the pressure. That was the number one thing that confidentially coaches are reaching out and just needed someone to talk to that could understand. And and so I think to Tim's point, if 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 we're if we create a safe place for these kids to know they can talk to us and just to visit and know that we really care and that they trust us enough to share, we can provide help. And what I learned in the professional community is there are grownups that are really battling with the pressures of, of the world. And my uh, quick pause, I had no idea that that would all of a sudden open a window of a safe place for other coaches to call and just just start talking. And, and, um, and I think if we can create that for the players where they know that we understand and they know it's safe, to, to, to share, it's amazing how much they'll talk. And, and that's so helpful in healing. Um, and yeah, it just struck me that, uh, the number of head, the number of coaches that were calling with basically they wouldn't have called it mental health, but that's what I was calling it as I was listening to the conversation. Well, I think Bronco, to your point, um, we can be our own worst enemies mm -hmm. and people say, what do you mean by that? Well, one, we're so ultra competitive. Two, I think sometimes if you're in the business long enough, you can lose track of why you got in it. And, you know, people will ask me, um, um, you know, my children will ask me, Dad, why aren't you why aren't you so happy? You, you, you won. Um, we've been fortunate to be um, really successful here over the last 30 years. And um, I think the problem is your expectations are so high. Um, yes. that when you win a game, it's kind of, okay, you just kind of move on. You don't necessarily celebrate it the way you might have, you know, year one through five. Conversely, you know, if you have a loss, I don't know about other guys, uh, Bronco, but for me, and I'm not proud of this, but uh, when we win, you know, just kind of move on. But when we lose, boy, it, it it's, it's harder than ever for me because I have yeah. so – much high expectations of myself. And I think the losses, the lows are lower than the highs are high. And I think that's the biggest difference for me at this stage of my career. First five years I got into it. Uh, it resonates with me. And I, I ended up in a similar place after 17 years, not 30. And we were sharing before the show, some of the wins, um, it was relief for not losing rather than happiness for winning. And, and I, I recognized it, and yet I didn't quite know how to, to restructure that. And so I saw it, knew it, called it what it was, but quite frankly, didn't know how to address it. And the losses at the same time, the effect of those were becoming exponentially greater in terms of their effect. And, and back to your point, I remember complete elation with any win early in my career. I mean, just exuberance and almost to where it just was, it, it was in a, um, a moment that almost was just fixed in time. 
for whatever reason, as you mentioned, through the years, the expectation for it just to be that all the time. And when it wasn't, um, it, it somehow was morphing. And so many coaches told me that exact thing. So what you articulated, I would say, is the number one narrative that I'm hearing now uh, from my colleagues of the losses last way longer and the wins aren't nearly as fulfilling. And and man, it would be great to be able to to reverse that trend for, for all of us that are leaders. Well, I think at the highest levels, that's going to be more so than ever challenging if for no other reason that, uh, you know, the uh, commercialization to the highest level uh, of uh, college football is uh, the horse has left the barn and it's not coming back. One of the things that I was just thinking as well as I love my favorite part was seeing my team every day. And I was inspired by my team, by young people and seeing their lives, seeing their interactions, seeing how resilient they were, right? Seeing a teammate put an arm around a teammate that might be struggling. I would hear a joke that was just amazingly funny. And just the timing was was great. And I would see these young people do these cool things every day, which gave me hope. Mm-hmm. And and if I were to say, do I miss anything? The daily interaction of just being with the next generation. Uh, I was inspired and, and again, very hopeful by what I saw from who they were and what they're capable of. And and that part um, is reason to, to celebrate. Well, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, right before our last game uh, against Princeton University, um, and this is not uncommon, um, I spoke to one of our former teams that won an Ivy championship with us. And uh, it happened to be the 2007 Ivy League champions. And I went out to, to speak to the group. And I, and I, I fellas, I can't stay long. I just wanted to say hello. And, and some of the kids I've been in regular contact with, kids is a relative, a relative yeah. term. Yeah. Um, and, and others, you know, you just do the year after year after year, they add up and kids go out and, you know, live their lives. You haven't, maybe haven't seen them since graduation or the last game they played. Um, but the greatest thing about it is when you have that connection to young people in such an incredibly competitive and intimate environment as college football, where you really need to be a team to be successful. It's, and I wish I could say that I'm the one that came up with this, but I'm pretty sure it was former New York Knickerbocker, Bill Bradley, upon the occasion of the death of his friend and teammate, the great Dave DeBusher, who was an all NBA player. He said, you know, that depth of connection that you have being part of a team in general and part of being a division one football champion or whatever it may be, uh, the NBA, he goes, that sense of belonging and that devotion to your teammates is really unique. It's like family without the complications. I just thought that was great. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, we, we certainly appreciate the time, Tim. I, I know we got, got you in between game planning meetings for, for your next game, and I, I think we would probably continue the conversation on for, for another hour or two, uh, just, just given the depth of, of your knowledge from, from leading the program for, for nearly three decades. But we appreciate the time. We appreciate the unique insight that you guys have, and, and good luck the rest of the season. Thank you very much, fellas. Great being with you. Bronco, good to see you. Great to see you, Coach. Good luck. Thank you. All right, for Bronco Mendenhall and Tim Murphy, I'm Brian Fisher. Thanks for joining us on Head Coach U, and we'll see you back here next week.